this series, it's really been birthed from a space of um, asking the question, where are we going as a community? Often people will say, so who is Watershed? Who are we? Who are we becoming? And, uh, or you should check out Watershed, and, and you try to articulate who, you, who we are. And it feels a little bit squishy. It's hard to sometimes put definition to it. And it feels, though, as of late, more and more we've been able to dial in who Watershed is and, and really what we are doing in terms of the kind of person that we are having the luxury of being able to see connect with the space. So, and most of that definition comes through a very brief journey I want to take you down. I talked a little bit about it a couple weeks ago, uh, but I, I want to summarize it maybe a little bit more cleanly. For many of us, we've come out of the church, come out of this church space. And for whatever reason, typically it's, it's a couple specifically, you leave that church space, your previous church world, and you are a part of Watershed. And invariably what we're finding, and we're seeing this as people are graduating from preface, we're seeing this as people are jumping into small groups, we're seeing this as people are serving, people leave that church space and they jump into this narrative that we call deconstruction and reconstruction. And basically, when one deconstructs, you ask all these hard questions, or you start maybe poking at some why we do what we do in the church world, and for whatever reason, that space that you came from does not like the idea that you're poking and prodding. They don't like the fact that you're asking some pretty sacred questions about some pretty sacred cows in that space, and we don't mess with those, at least that, that environment tells you so. And so then you begin prodding a little bit more, and before you know it, you're just not comfortable in that space, or maybe you're kicked out, maybe you're feeling as though you're an outsider, and so why would you go there? And so you end up looking for a different experience, a different community. All the while, you are what we call deconstructing. You are breaking down your assumptions of what you've held to, maybe for many of you, myself included, decades. And so the, the, the breaking of that down is a very challenging journey at times. And so you go through the, the deconstruction, then you go into the reconstruction space, and you begin saying, well, maybe there's a new way of seeing faith. Maybe there's a new way of seeing God. And you show up here, and maybe the, you're on this downward journey, and you feel like God is nowhere to be had. It's all gone. It's all over. Uh, you don't believe in anything anymore. Um, or maybe you feel like, no, there's still this sense of hope. There's still a sense of something down the road. And you have this, this sense of you go through deep pain. And that deep pain often then drives you out of your space, out of the previous church world, it drives you into a space that still says, but I long for God. I still long for the sense that God is out there. I still have this, this hope that the, the God that I have spent decades pursuing, there is a version of that to be had, that I'm not, I'm not deconstructed everything away, that I'm actually grounded in something, and that sense is that God is out there, and I'm looking for him. And what it creates is many of you and your story, the post-churched person, that is the narrative that is many of you. You're, you're, you're post-evangelical, you're post-Catholic, you're post-Protestant, you're post-Hindu, you're post-whatever it is, and you were that. Now you're, you're saying that the fundamentalism of that experience has driven me away, but I still believe that there is something worth my pursuit in terms of God, and you, you are going after that pursuit. And you, you, you show up here one day, and you begin to realize, well, maybe we get to help create new filters and grids and containers with which you identify and it leaves you with a sense of hope. Like maybe, maybe there actually is a future that's really optimistic. That maybe there is a sense that I can re-love God in a way that I've never done so before. And I can do it with people or asking all the same really beautiful questions. And I can sit in a room with a group of people like we talked about two weeks ago. Because this is part of liberation. That as I'm freeing and liberating myself, developmentally I find that I can sit well with people who also have freed and, and, and liberated themselves, but you may not see the world differently. But part of that is, part of your development in that is that you have the ability to do so. And so we sit with these, like this chunk, all this stuff, this, this deconstruction, reconstruction, longing for God, post-church, hope. We sit with all of that, and what it does is it forces us to ask a really solid question. Then what is it we are identifying with? Sure, we can say God, and that's good, and that's, that's fine, but sometimes we need a few more handles that allows us to get at, well, what's it mean to identify with God in this context, in this post-church culture, in this space of a progressive journey? What does it mean to identify and who, who is God, and how do we then sort of have these traditions or have these, uh, these, these, these skill sets or these practices or these new learnings that allow us to move forward in that journey? So I want to go somewhere today, if you'll let me. And I'm going to ask for a massive amount of grace. I had somebody in the first service that said, Scott, just be careful, I got my mother-in-law here today. 
I'm like, oh, nuts. It was the worst son- t- Get her out of here. So I'm going to say, if you got your proverbial mother-in-law here today, it is not the day for her to be here. And I'm going to ask for massive amounts of grace. Um, and I'm not trying to create disruption for the sake of disruption, but I think, it's, I think it fits. I think it works. Again, if you grew up in any kind of religious infrastructure, in that, in that context, you know, the, the church steeple building kind of space, you were seen, you were understood, you viewed your world as being a victim. You were, you were enslaved by your world. You remember the stories of Adam and Eve and the serpent and the snake and the temptation and being thrown out of the garden. And you are this, the, the story that came from that space is that you are this wicked sinner deserving of a hell and you will spend the entirety of your life trying to dodge this bad dude called a devil or Satan or something and he is out to get you and to destroy you. And the only shot you have is a God that's willing to kill his son for you. When you stop and think about that. Why do I want to go to church on a Sunday morning? Where is the excitement in that? There's no light. Right? So what, what's happening is the church, for hundreds of years, we love to hold you and control you by fear, by pushing down on you. And we give you these kinds of narratives, and you hold to them, and you believe that you're nothing. And the only shot at a future... The only shot of you experiencing wholeness and freedom from all this supposed oppression and darkness is when you die. Oh, man, that's a bummer. I got 70, 80 years to tolerate this experience. But maybe actually that worldview is not the way it's supposed to be. Maybe it's possible that your existence is not about digression, that things don't necessarily need to get worse, although we have bad days and bad weeks and bad years and we're victims of tragic experiences and we have massive loss in our lives and we have death and illness, maybe those things are a part of life and that is, but also that the way in which you see who you are, maybe in this progressive narrative, can be different. Maybe in this post-church space, you can take seriously that you have been made in the image of God, that somehow that's a win. That somehow that's something to pursue, that's something to hold on to, that's something of consequence, that's something of meaning, that, I, that helps you identify as though you somehow are valued, that the tapes that play in our minds that the churches have told us that we are meaningless and we are of no value until somehow we believe a certain way. Maybe those tapes aren't the tapes that we need to be holding on to, that maybe we need to be playing these messages that are saying, well, but I've been... I've been made in the image of God, and I've been made with this sense of identity and this sense of something bigger than myself. And so I want to throw out a word today that I know is loaded with a whole bunch of stuff for most of us. This word has such different meaning to each of us depending on where you grew up or where you came from. But what if part of the way to describe your journey, I use the word evolution? And I don't necessarily mean evolution like creation versus evolution, a la, we've got to preach it in our schools, the South, Georgia, right, that kind of stuff. I don't, that's not what I'm talking about. But yet I'll talk a little bit about that. But that's not necessarily where I'm trying to go exclusively. That what if we can look at who we are and the assumption is we start out maybe underdeveloped, just like a kid, just like a human would, and we evolve, we develop, we grow. We mature, make bad mistakes, bump into things, do things wrong, do things well, love well, hate well, all those things. Like we do, we mess up, but the the idea is that we are growing, we are moving forward. What if evolution becomes part of our narrative, part of our journey with, to, and towards God? And I'm not a scientist, many sorts of imagination, but the stuff I'm reading these days is, is, is just exploding my mind. The challenging of, of how I see the world has been so much more open in the sense of the quantum physics space implies that we are expanding and growing. That the universe literally is expanding. That there is some sort of energy, some sort of force that is literally growing the universe. The scientific world holds hold to that standard now. The quantum physics old worldview holds that the old, the old Newtonian world doesn't. This new sense that we are uh, growing and that we are expanding, we are morphing. So what if we move out of that church disposition that says you are devolving, you are unraveling, and what if we move to the space that says you are actually evolving, that you are shifting, that you're moving into a new space, that you're growing, 
that your, your identity is editing in, in a beautiful way. Because if you look at the Bible, the Bible speaks to this. So I'm not going to pull out one verse. I'm going to talk about the, the larger expansion of it. And we've done this a few times over the years. But the story of the scriptures is an expansive story. It's a story of humankind with God evolving. And here's what I mean by that. I mean, you've heard this over the years. The Jewish consciousness came on the scene about 4,500 years ago, 4,000 years ago, somewhere in there. In the day, at that time, the idea that a deity would identify with his or her minions, his or her people, the way that Yahweh identified with us was mind-blowing in its day. Because for the most part, and we look back in history, all we know is that deity saw themselves as sort of the king, the leader, the influencer, and we as the minions served at the pleasure of that deity. And often we'd be wiped out, destroyed. And we even see, we see that in, in mythical culture, we see that uh, in, in, in Greek mythology, that the, that the deities were sort of the, the, the rulers and the rest of us kind of served at their pleasure. But you see a complete flip, a complete different identity in terms of Yahweh and Judaism saying, actually we are introducing a God that loves his creation that looks at his creation as part of who they are, that they actually identify and will say things like, I am making them in my image. This kind of narrative is a deeply evolved narrative of a God, of deity. That's like how the Old Testament begins. And from there on out is this continual expansive narrative. We see other pieces of the Old Testament. Again, you got to remember, humans are writing this, right? So they are going to write the Bible with their filters and with their grids and with their understandings. And you see, sometimes they, they write really good things about God and sometimes they write some really jacked up things. Like somehow God told them to wipe out children and women and, and other armies. And I would just argue that was just people misinterpreting what they understood God to be. But then you see some authors of the Old Testament writing quite developmentally. They're saying things like, treat your slaves well. That's an evolved narrative, especially when slavery was assumed in the day. It was part of the culture. But actually, within Judaism, they're saying, you know what, we need to treat our slaves well. We need to do, do them well in terms of just seeing them as some asset. That's an evolved conversation. You jump ahead, and we could talk about several things in the Old Testament. You jump ahead to the New Testament, Jesus changes everything in terms of an evolutionary perspective. He says things like, if you are a Jew or a Gentile, meaning a non-Jew, you're equal, you're in, you're good. If you are a Greek or a Roman or a non-Roman, you're good, we're all equal, it doesn't matter. He says stuff that is, would have, was, was uh, corrosive to culture in the first century. Men and women, you're equal, you're in too. I mean, women were second-class citizens, so, so for a leader to make those kinds of statements, again, was mind-blowing in the day. You look at the, the, the narrative past the Bible, you see humankind evolving. We have a long way to go in terms of how we equalize uh, men and women's roles, but we are way better than we ever were. Women can vote, women have a voice, women are in leadership, w women are m movers and shakers in our culture. Uh, we still have a long way to go in terms of how we, we navigate the, the, the color barriers and some of those things. But we're, we're, seeing, we're seeing growth in that in terms of over humankind. So the biblical narrative is truly a narrative of evolution, of shifting. And we're not even talking about medicine and engineering and all those things, the technology, all that stuff. We're just talking about the human condition and how we see each other. Because the human condition that I was taught in my experience in my church world was you are... Uh, minimal in value, you are wicked, your default is to, poor, is to make poor decisions, and what if actually that's not the narrative at all? That the narrative is that actually we are not devolving, we are evolving. That for most of you, if I were to sit you down today and say, do you long to make a difference? Do you long to make a dent? Do you want to change the world? Do you, do you see yourself as being an asset that can bring impact and influence to other people? Most of you would say yes, because I would argue your wiring, your desire internally is to mark the world, is to make a difference. It matters to us that we live on purpose, that we live with intentionality. And so I argue that in the progressive space, that as we evolve, that we are evolving from a place of wanting to do well, wanting to do good.
We are all on a journey, and we are all progressing. I know, and once I had to set this up, because I want to ask you a couple of questions, and so I had to give you at least a pretext as to what I mean by we are evolving or evolution. And I hope I gave you just enough, because I have a question I want to ask you. I'm going to invite you to pull your phones out and open your little notes tab, because I want you to thumb some of these ideas. Of course, some of you are on Facebook, not listening to anything. So not, but for those of you that are there, go to your, your app, that's your, your notes app. And I've I got a question I want to ask you. The first question is, and I want you to kind of take some notes on this. When you think about your own spiritual journey, what would you say has evolved for you? So when you look at who you are and your discovery with faith, with God, uh, what would you say has been something that you feel like you've clicked forward in? Maybe it's how you see people. Maybe it's how you see justice. Maybe it's a generosity conversation. Maybe it's relationships. Maybe it's, it's, a, it's a mind game. It's the, it's the grids and the filters with which you see life now. I, it, it doesn't matter, and there's no one right answer. But how would you see that? There's something about kind of penning it and, and thinking about it or thumbing it with your thumbs. Second question, and this is a little bit more of an existential question. Um, so the assumption is God is with us in our journey. God is a part of your experience that when you look at who you are, if you've ever taken God seriously, you assume that God is somehow connected to your decision-making, to your encounters, to your good things in life, to your bad things in life. So I'm going to ask that question with that mindset. And this is, again, this is a larger existential conversation, but I, I, I think you guys are pretty confident in this space. What role do you think God plays on your ever-evolving spiritual journey is God deeply another way of asking it is God deeply involved in the details of your life or is there a sense of freedom to make your own choices so I, what I want to do is I want to take give you guys just a, a minute to sit with that the questions are going to stay on the screen and um, while you're thinking about that Austin's going to be playing some music for us
drive something. Um, you guys are smart people. You're deep people. There's a lot there. I know because I get to spend time with you guys and I get to hear what's going on in your souls. We did this in the first service. I want to try it this service. Um, I'm going to invite you to turn to a couple people next to you. If there's somebody near you that's by themselves, suck them in. It doesn't matter. I know they're probably new. They're like, I don't want to hear what you have to say. It's all right. They don't have to talk, but at least suck them in. Two to three people. I want you to vet these two questions with a couple of different people. At least one of the person, if not two. Here's the deal. Only answer one of them. So somebody choose to answer question one in that group. Somebody answer question two. We don't have time to talk about all of it. And you got like uh, 180 seconds to deal with all these, the most the deepest questions of your life. So we're going to turn with each other and address these conversations with question each other and we'll go from there. All right, so here's what we're going to do. I'm making some assumptions this morning based on some of the relationships I have with you guys, but I'm making some assumptions. Um, I would like to hear from you, what you, some of the things that you just share with each other. I would like for us to hear some of your thoughts on that as well. So I, I've, we've got a couple of mics in the back. If you're interested in helping me answer question number one, when you think about your own spiritual journey, what would you say has evolved for you? Um, I would love to hear like 20-second bursts of what that looks like. Who's willing to help answer question number one for me? Um, my name is Laura, and I will try and be very brief. I'm actually not totally sure that there is a God anymore, mm -hmm. which has brought about an immense amount of doubt. Yeah. But much like fear, it's, it feels as though it's serving a purpose in my life. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know what that purpose is, but it feels like it's purposeful. I have the freedom to explore other religions, which I never had before, and I don't need to be right or have the answers. Um, it's more about learning and growing rather than having it all together. And the new multiple meanings of the divine, like the universe, connection with other people, with nature, actually allows me to feel closer to God, which has brought about an immense amount of healing physically and um, mentally, emotionally, indirectly through all of this. Wow. You got to read a book. That's awesome. <laughs> Excellent, Laura. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate your, your honesty in that. Um, yeah, to be able to sit with all those variables, that's part of, we talked about it last, uh, last week, if you remember, we talked about the idea of what does it mean, or two weeks ago, as we progress along, to be able to move, part of it is, it's like the ult one of the ultimate spaces developmentally is when you can sit with your own worldview as not being sure as to what that looks like and others simultaneously. So thank you, Laura, for sharing that. My name's Miles, and hey, Miles. the main thing that's evolved for me is, wasn't necessarily about God, but it was about God's people. Um, mm. I was raised Southern Baptist, but in a way where I believed that you know God was loving, but it was it was the people who were messed up and who were always you know not good. Yep. But you know through deconstruction and reconstruction over about the past three years, I've been able to understand that you know both are amazingly beautiful mm. and that it's God's people who because we're made in the image of God that we're just as wonderful as mm. God is. Excellent. Miles. That's the main thing. Thank you for sharing that. That's good. Thank you. I'm Jennifer and I'm relatively new to Watershed and I grew up um, in a household that didn't really go to church. I went to church on my own and um, as I was sharing with them, my brother's an artist and he has um, even at a young age, drew this picture of God sitting in a big chair, you know, yeah. way up there, pointing down at him, you're a sinner, you know, and that's how we were raised, and that's how the churches that we went to were told us, and since my journey in de of deconstruction, I've learned that, yes, we maybe were born sinners, but we have grace, mm -hmm. and I, you know, prefer to think that we weren't born just damaged goods, yeah. But through our choices, maybe we've made mistakes, but God has grace and can forgive us. Excellent, Jennifer. So. Thank you. Awesome. Um, all right, so let's play with the second question. Now, again, I, I know this is a little bit more of an intense question. There's, some, there's a lot of weight to this. But, again, um, there isn't a wrong answer. But I, it's helpful, I think, for us. We make assumptions often, so I, I love hearing from you guys what some of this looks like. So when you think of your role, when we think of God involved in your spiritual journey, what does that look like for you? Is he intricately involved in the, in the, in the details, or is there a larger thing that's happening? Uh, I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts. The role that God plays is parental, 
As far as the second question goes, in the decision making, I kind of see it still as being a parental role, as mm -hmm. in like I have the freedom to make my own decisions, but if I need that help, if I need that guidance, that um, then I can go to him yeah. for those things as well. I love it, excellent. So, so it's kind of bipolar, but you can see both sides of it a little bit. That's awesome, excellent, very good. Thank you for sharing that. Hi, I'm DJ. Um, just for this question, I, I found it a little simple for me, uh, like awesome. at least at this stage of my life. Yeah. So, um, but God, you know, while I know I believe that he can have any part he wants in my life, that, um, that he doesn't want that. He, he wants to let us sort of have that freedom to experience mm. and grow and learn. And, and, um, and, and, I, and so I, I feel a great freedom in that uh, and in my choices from on a day-to-day -day basis. Thank you for sharing that. So what it, what's been happening in some of the conversations I heard earlier this morning as well, for some of us, um, it felt as though God was, God micromanages our lives and the details of our lives. And for others of us, it felt as though God's kind of this larger, uh, kind of maybe some guidance, but not somehow controlling every variable. And I think it's an important question, because if we're looking at our lives from an evolutionary standpoint, if we are somehow saying that there's a sense that we are uh, morphing and growing and developing and maturing with all our imperfections, with all our mistakes, and guys, we have to do this with a sense of humility. I, I hope that's implied in here. I don't think any of us are here today somehow thinking, we've got it figured out, uh, we've got it mastered, uh, we're better than those people in, the, in our previous church cultures. That's not what I'm saying at all. Uh, what I'm saying is I think we have come to the realization that, that it's hard to say this is the only thing, the only way something happens. And so we're open to playing with other containers and other metaphors. And that's what we're inviting us into today. So if the question is, or if the point is that we are evolving and, and growing and shifting, then for me, the, the question that I have is, where is God in that journey? How does he play out? Um, because in my previous world, in my previous environment, um, God was controlling everything. God was micromanaging every detail. But to the post-church person, God does not engineer or control the evolutionary process. Um, rather, God makes a world that can make itself. And this is a very important point. God makes something and he sets it in motion and it then responds. That God makes a world that makes itself. That he creates the, the essence of all that is. Call it Big Bang, call it creationism, call it whatever the word that you need. And he set it in motion and now it's happening, it's rolling. It's sort of like setting a, putting a car at the top of a hill, putting it in neutral and no driver and letting it go. What's happening? That car is barreling down the hill, and it is making edits and shifts based on what it is connecting with, what it is hitting. Also, the environment is being impacted and hit and marked by that car, by that automobile. The point is that things are moving and shifting and ebbing and flowing and making a difference on each other. That God makes a world that can make itself. He set it in motion, and the world is constantly in response to itself. The universe is constantly in response to itself. So hang with me for like two seconds here, and I, I, I want to wax a, a little bit scientific, of which I am not a scientist. So bear with me for those of you who are scientists, and you're going to correct me afterwards. That's fine. I'll take it. But just hang with me here a second. So this biologist, Charles Birch, says that evolution proceeds through the interplay between purpose and chance. So when we look at something shifting, something ebbing and flowing and evolving, purpose and chance play a place in that. And what do we mean by chance? That there's no preordained blueprint that God or anything else has written. That the universe is happening sometimes with intentionality and then actually a lot of it by happenstance. That car barreling down is making a mark, making a dent, and that car is being dented and marked by the environment around it. That there is this sense of randomness and chaos at all levels of creation. So last weekend, that storm that came our way, for days leading up to it, maybe a week and a half or so leading up to it, we were attempting to try to articulate what's going to happen with that storm. Where is it going? And low pressures and high pressures and all this stuff doing. And somehow this storm, and we were attempting to predict it, and we had no idea where it was going. It was random and chaotic. Was God involved in that? Well, maybe so. 
Did God create or set into motion creation, a world, a culture where high and low pressures exist, and when those things come together, you get crazy storms and crazy water and crazy winds, and we have no idea how it's going to play out. Maybe that's more the reality with which we exist. And there seems to be a sense that there's purpose in how we observe the evolution, how we observe um, the, the, the universe or nature in general. There seems to be something drawing and pulling forward towards. So uh, our neighbors have this plant that you attach it kind of at the base of your house. You kind of put it near the house, and it, it, it intuitively knows somehow how to like suck onto the house, and it grows. And it's supposed to be like this sort of arbor kind of deal over the archway of your home, and it looks really nice on their house. And uh, so we, we, we bought one, and I think we're killing it, but it's not quite having the same energy that it, theirs does. But when you look at theirs, it's, it's moving with the sense of intentionality. I mean, they have to trim it, they have to you know, prune it, but it's moving like something's pulling it out of the ground towards the building, and it has, it's taking over with quite elegance and beauty towards this sense of something. It's moving towards a space, towards a place. That patterns emerge out of chaos. If I could put you into a helicopter and you could hover over trees of a forest... You could look down, you can see some trees are short, some trees are tall, some trees are bigger and wider, There's, some trees are dead, some trees are different colors. And then if you were to expand backwards and it was a, a, you know, a green rain season, you would look out, you would see all this green foliage and it would look consistent and beautiful and non-chaotic. And yet when you get close, it's clearly chaotic. This sense of the duality of both spaces, that randomness and purpose seem to dictate part of how we see evolution, that the dance between purpose and chance underlies the create and creates advances of the universe, underlies the creative advances of the universe. If this is true, if there's a sense that the world is growing, that the universe is shifting, that the, the scientists are telling us that it's developing, it's, it's expanding, if that is true, if you and I are at our core born with an intent to make a difference, to change the world. If a plant, a greenery, can somehow extend itself around a house with intentionality, then wouldn't it be safe to assume that you and I are wired to progress? That it is part of literally our DNA that we evolve. Not that we devolve, but that we press forward. And so it continues to pose the question, then where is God in that journey? And where is God in this process of chaos and order? Well, if, again, if, if God sort of launched, if he set everything in, in motion in the beginning. So we look at the writings of Paul. And Paul, Paul seems to allude to this idea that the, the Christ, he talks about this in his epistles, the Christ is holding all together that is. Or another way of saying that potentially is spirit is controlling everything. It's kind of, it's kind of the essence, that it's the glue that keeps all together. Or that God is somehow pushing into existence. That there's a spiritual side of, of biology that's saying everything is together because of essence. Because of this, this connection. So this, there's a force either at the beginning of creation or there's something pulling us into the future. If that is true, and if that means that God is involved in the nuances and the de details of our lives... But yet, also simultaneously, the progressive conversation is saying that God is not controlling the outcomes. That God set things in motion, but he's not involved in the day-to-day -day nuances of somehow trying to make or break or fix or heal things. And here's what I mean by that. When I say that God somehow controls all the nuances of my day, when I say, because I grew up in a culture, I grew up in, in this, was, this was part of the, the subculture of what I grew up in terms of the church. So I've got this sort of like green, non-color, mossy shirt on. That culture I grew up in would say, God ordained, he predestined that I would wear this shirt today. And God knows exactly where I'm going to go to lunch today, and he predestined that I would go to that meal. And he knows that I would marry my wife, and that I would have two sons with blonde hair. And he predestined that I would have this job one day. And, that I, and so there was this sense that everything is orchestrated. That is fine if I'm looking for God to meet all my needs because I'm afraid of making my own choices. That, that's okay if, as long as everything's going good. But here's when it goes south, when that parent loses a child. Wait a minute, are you telling me, Scott, that God somehow preordained 
that I lose my child? Uh, that, that, I mean, that sounds like kind of a dark God. Wait a minute, you're telling me that God somehow knew about this and didn't do anything about it? Because I thought he was all powerful. Couldn't he just fix this with sort of some kind of magical thing? And why didn't he do that? And why did he allow my family member to pass, as I talked to somebody earlier? Or why did he allow this person in my life to make these horrific decisions and leave me and, and then continue to make more bad decisions if that is the worldview that we have of God, then of course so many of us in the church want nothing to do with God because these seems, it seems so dark and dictatorial and devastating. But what if God sets into motion all that is and we get to be a part of responding to the infrastructure and to the systems that he created? That we get to have children because that's what our biology allows us to have and we get to be parents and sometimes we parent really well and sometimes we don't parent well and, and sometimes our kids are really good to us and other times they're not but the idea is that it's like moving forward and what if instead of God somehow being a God that's about every detail of our lives he's setting everything but he sets things into motion and so the question then still surfaces well where is God in the process what if God's in it with us what if God is in, the, is in the nuances of the day? He might not be pulling triggers of all those nuances. He might be living in the chaos and the unknowing of what's going to happen, just like you and I do. But he's in it with us. The best metaphor I can sort of conjure is sort of like what my sister said earlier a moment ago, that uh, it's, it's sort of like a parental kind of deal. I remember going off to college. And my freshman year, it was a little bit of, all right, son, you're gone. <laughs> you know, you're, you're out of here. But I still had a credit card. I'd call back and say, hey, Dad, I need a, a pair of shoes. You know, my shoes are wore out. Or I'm, I'm, I got a date coming up. Man, I'm, I'm out of money. Can I use the card? And yeah, go ahead, Scott. And that's fine. And, um, and no, you can't. You're sophomore year, you got to get your own job. You can't, use, you can't use the car as much as you want. And, and by the way, um, you know, careful on here. And no, you can't. You got to buy your own car if you want your own car now. And I'm taking the car back. And you gotta, you're growing up a little bit. And before I know it, I graduate. I can recall my dad, the, after I graduated, I got my first paycheck. I was like, Dad, toilet paper is expensive. Wow. <laughs> and there is this sense of my father, my parents, my mom, they're all there for me. But a little bit more and more, they were saying, Scott, I'm releasing you to make some decisions. I'm releasing you to engage the universe and the culture and the relationships with which I've given you. And yes, I'm in it with you. Yeah, my, my mom was here in the first service, and she's here, and she's in it with me, and she's a part of what's going on here. But there's also part of it where like, I, I've, I've released you, Scott, and you, I'm here, but you also don't need me to manage every aspect of your life. But there's a sense that we need each other, and we're in it together. And I wonder if God is not sitting here with you saying, all right, I know for some of you, my heart breaks this morning, because I know there are people in this room, my brothers and my sisters whom I love, who are going through difficult, difficult times. Loss of a grandparent. I talked to one of my sweet, sweet sisters just a moment ago. Another person, just the spouse is, is left kicking and screaming and leaving them high and dry with the kids. Like, what's that mean? And for some of you, you're trying to figure out, I don't know how, if I can stay with this person in this relationship again. Others of you are struggling with parenting. You're trying to figure out, how, how do I love my child and also try to like, sort, of, sort of hone in who they are becoming? Maybe some of you are trying to figure out like the work front. Man, God, I'm, I've been in this job for 20 years, and this is brutal, and I, I, want, an, I want out. And, or you, maybe you lost your job, and you're feeling as though you, you don't know what's next. And I wonder if the dialogue with God, with, whether it's prayer or reflection or meditation or whatever it is you do, the dialogue with God isn't so much like, God, let's fix this thing or, or help me heal this or like, let's, just, let's just call it a day. Or, but I wonder if the dialogue is maybe, God, uh, you can just give me the strength to go through this process. And maybe God is in it with you saying, yes, and you know what? We both really don't know exactly what's going to happen, but we're in it together. That maybe the narrative of the universe expanding, maybe the, the story of you evolving is not always somehow figuring everything out, but maybe the, the best part of that evolutionary journey for you is you deepening your connection with God and you're doing it together with him. And there's a ton of chance, there's a ton of stuff that's unknown, but that's life. And for some of us in this space, the most difficult part, some of the most difficult part of deconstructing, of asking the hard questions that you ask, this was, this was the core, this was the centerpiece for me and, and, and the biggest challenge, was letting go of a God that just fixed my needs. On the Enneagram, I'm a six. I live in fear when I'm not healthy. 
I like for an entity or a deity or an essence to be there to fix my needs. And what I had to do is I had to reconstruct that maybe God wasn't there to fix all my needs, but maybe God was there to be with me in the journey. And that I have community of people around me that are also in that same journey. As I'm vulnerable with them and they're vulnerable with me, we get to share this thing together with all our imperfections, with all the times of really having success and in quality of relationship and then saying things we shouldn't say and butting heads and hurting each other. Like, that's part of the dance. But to know that we have a future rooted in hope because there's something out there that the, that the universe at a scientific level, at a philosophical level, at a God level is pushing and pulling us towards means something is happening out there that might be worth saying, all right, I'm going to take the ride. That you've been created to evolve. It's part of the DNA of who you are. And that in all of it, at best, all we know, all we know, or all we can, again, even this we still have to hold maybe loosely, but that we, I'm, I'm assuming that God is in the details with us, that he's in it, that he's not orchestrating how it plays out, but that he's in it with us. I want to close by reading Psalm 23. I want to invite you to close your eyes and kind of just focus on these words. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So, Father, we are honored, privileged, afraid, and discouraged at times, and hopeful other times of what it means to, as a community, of, a, of people that are living out this sort of naivete, this, this new space of, of what it means to embrace you. We are letting go of whole swatches of assumptions that we've had in the past, but maybe kind of jumping into new assumptions, many of which we will also at some point probably move from, maybe evolve away from. And may we have a sense of connection with you. May we have an awareness of what it means to uh, give of ourselves. Like the first one said in the first service, like there's a sense of what we're doing here is not just about our own needs, but it's also about giving away of who we are. God, waking up sometimes can be really painful and because it implies there's so much more that needs to happen. And I and, and I know that in my own life, I know that in this community here. But we look forward to the days ahead, Father. There's a sense of hope. There's a sense of identity. There's a sense of rooting in. And thank you that we get to do this together. In the Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you.